डॉक्टर मेडिकल डॉक्टर देवदर माय प्रोफेसर और प्रोफेसर मोटी डॉक्टर लाचमी वो आल्सो माय प्रोफेसर मिस्टर प्रवीण कार्ले प्रोफेसर चौबल एंड फ्रेंड्स आई एम डिलाइटेड टू बी हियर and really the main reason for that is that I have had an opportunity to meet uh, Professor Murthy after many, many years. Sir, I am really indebted to you for if I remember whatever little bit I know about financial management, about management accounting was when you taught us. And truly those very simple principles, whether it was sources or uses of funds, whether it was fund flow, whether the importance of cash flow, contribution analysis. I mean, I have since then learned a lot of, read a lot about very complex calculations and complex formula for ECF and IRR and all that. Let me tell you that the basics which we taught us have held us in very good stead. So I am forever indebted to you, sir. And when you asked me to come here, I had no, I mean, there was nothing else but, uh, I mean, I was willingly and happily accepted it because of all that I have learned. I'm going to uh, speak to you about what really is in the conference, the theme of the conference about India, the paradigm shift, I think Dr. Bedekar and Professor Devdar have already introduced the subject. So let me start by what I like to think of the vision for India. And uh, whilst I was in the car, one of your students, Hartwig, was in me, I asked him, what would you like to hear? So they said, you want to hear my experience, and that's what Professor Murthy also said. That was not part of my plan, because I hesitate to talk about it, but I shall include that as well as we go ahead. So the vision for India today, I want to really begin with something uh, which is which was written by Rabindranath Tagore several years ago and which on the 50th anniversary of our independence was spoken again this poem in the parliament by this by Pratap Sharma. So I'm going to just replay what he spoke of in the 50, uh, on the 50th uh, anniversary celebration, by which I know many of you must have heard. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the fierce dream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action. Into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country away. I think it's as relevant as it was in 1910 today. Michael Porter, whom you have all heard of, the great management guru, says that really the ultimate, the fundamental 
fundamental determinants of national competitive advantage are rooted in national character. So what is it that makes up national character is what I want to speak to you about today. And there are really three parts of my talk today. The first is knowledge, because here we are in a situation which imparts us learning and knowledge. The other is on leadership and values, and the last topic I want to touch upon is belief. I'm going to read out something to you which I read about a few years ago. It was an article which came in the business world, and it talked about the famous mathematician of India, Bhaskaracharya. Now, Bhaskaracharya, it, is, it seems that in the 12th century, he was speaking to a group of students. And this was found, what he was speaking to them was found in a place which was near the Alora Caves. And here he addresses students, and Bhaskaracharya, a very learned mathematician, as well as who understood astrology, and could see into the future, talked about what uh, to his students, what he thought the future of our country was. And he said that he was, as he looked into the future, he was very worried about what was happening, what was going to happen to India. Because he felt that, again, here was a society which was being divided. Here was a society which was being divided between the, literally the haves and the lower classes, the have-nots, between men and women, and he felt that science learning was taking a back seat. And therefore he said that for several centuries, for several yugas, he says, India would go through a very difficult time. But then he said, at the end of it, I find that there is hope and that there is a bright future for India. And he talks about how computers, how computing, how the knowledge of Sanskrit, Panini Sanskrit, will be used in, let's say, computers, and how India will come back again, because it would be the knowledge society, and India would be dominant once again. And he said that knowledge is God. So today, what we find is really that it is the knowledge society that is driving us ahead. We all know about the IT services sector, pharmaceuticals, for instance. India is the fourth largest producer of pharmaceutical products in the world in terms of volume. We have the, we have the largest number of US FDA approved plants, more than any other country after the US. If you see manufacturing, a lot of people talk about China. But wherever there is a knowledge component in industry, then that's where India goes ahead. Whether it's in R&D, whether it's in engineering design, all these is where the Indian economy is going ahead because these are knowledge based. And you can see that it's now being recognized globally. I think over more than 100 of the Fortune 500 companies have got R&D centers set up in India. In terms of pharmaceuticals, almost 10% of the researchers and 15% of the scientists in the pharma and in the biotech R&D industry in the US are of Indian origin. So a lot of it is being run by Indians. But as you said, Professor Devnan, knowledge cannot be an exclusive domain of the field. Each Indian must have access to knowledge. And the starting point of this is really education. I'm associated with a group called Pratham, which really, whose vision is to give education to every child in India. Every child ought to be learning. And Pratham has done an All India survey, which was released uh, recently by uh, the chairman, the deputy chairman of the planning commission. And that was quite revealing. It said that almost out of the 93% of the children enrolled in schools, 52% could not read in spite of being in school, and these are children in the fourth and the fifth grade. So that is a problem. 
and 40% of them could not perform simple arithmetic. So therefore, there is an issue that we need to tackle. But all this, I think, if knowledge is important, what is really important to take India ahead would be leadership and values. And that is what I want to talk to you. You are all going to be future leaders. In whatever you do, your management institution is teaching you to be leaders. And as we leaders, future leaders, you have certain rights, but you have lots of obligations as well. And this is said very beautifully in the Gita, when it says in the chapter 3 of 21 verse, how behaves the best of men, so behave the rest of men. His example they will show, saying, he did so, we do so. So all of us who are more privileged than others have an obligation to, to set examples as good leaders because people will say, he did so, we do so. People will follow us. And who else but the best, in my, example, in my view, the best example of leadership has been provided by our own country in the form of Gandhiji, who was the greatest leader of all times. May we please recollect or please just go back into history and see what was in the early 1900s. Here was a country which had been ruled by foreign rulers for several centuries. Whether it was the Brits, whether it was the Mongols, before that the other people coming in from the northwest, it was a country which was subjugated. People had lost confidence. Literacy levels were very low. We were a poor country. We were a divided country. That was the situation in the early 90s. And who did we have on the opposite side? You had the mightiest empire in the world. The empire which it said that the sun never set on the British Empire. And they had dominated this country for several hundreds of years. And this man took on this, the greatest empire, and humbled it. And therefore, I think some of the qualities that of leadership Really, one is an indomitable will. So as Gandhi said, great challenges are not overcome by physical strength or mental capacity, but rather by indomitable will. I mean, who would have thought in 1925, if you were a betting man, would you have bet that India would have got freedom and that the British would have been overthrown and Indians would have got independence? Nobody. It's almost like assuming that Bermuda would win the World Cup. <laughs> Can't happen. But yet, we did. So, if we have to succeed in life, I think the example I'd like you to take from Gandhiji is that if you have a will, if you have an incompatible will, then what really looks insurmountable today can be easily, or can be won. This is the favorite quote as far as our group is concerned. This is what is our guiding quote. And I want to read this out to you. A lot of people say that we Indians are fatalistic. And Indians will say, ki jo mere haak mein likha hai, jo mere nasik mein hai, ho hoga. But that's not what the Upanishads teach us. The Upanishads say, you are what your deep driving desire is. As is your desire, so is your will. As is your will, so is your deed. And as your deed is, so is your destiny. So really, your deep driving desire, what is really inside you, can help you, makes you do certain deeds, and that helps you fashion your destiny. I think that is what Gandhiji demonstrated. It was his deep driving desire to get freedom for India, and he did all these things, and that was ultimately the destiny. And I think, at least in my life, I've found that through many difficulties, if you really have internally a deep driving desire, that 
to be your destiny. Let me give you the example of pharmaceuticals. We were a group which was in textiles for several centers, for several years before, and there was an opportunity to get into pharmaceuticals through an acquisition in 1988. We did that. And at that time, I remember, we had no experience of pharmaceuticals. We did not know what is the fee of pharmaceuticals. But yet, at that time, I made a presentation to the board when we acquired this company in 88, that from a turnover, which was then about 17 crores, that we would get into a leadership position by 2000. And therefore, and then we did everything possible. We can't just have a desire and not do anything. We did, we worked hard, and by 2000, from a number, a rank in the industry, which we acquired was 48, we came to the rank of 4 by 2000. So it is possible that if you have a deep driving desire and you do your things, that destiny also is shaped by you. The other thing I think is that we all need to dream. The mightiest words have been accomplished by men who have kept the ability to dream great dreams. If you don't dream, and as young people, as you're entering into the world of business and industry, if you don't dream, nothing will happen. I can give you an example. It was in 1998 when we, were, we had a factory which was in the heart of South Bombay. And this was a very high cost factory, which was an extremely expensive and a non-viable unit. And we didn't know what to do with it. And then, while discussing and all that, we had, let's say, we had the intention of, let's say, we had the dream that let's convert this into something which has never been done in India before. And then, there were a lot of people who said, no, this is not possible, it's not done, it's not going to be viable. But fortunately, we stuck by what we had dreamt and then created what was then India's first shopping complex called Crossroads. And this was literally on the, not on the basis of a lot of research, not on the basis of a lot of consultants uh, advising us what to do, but on the basis of understanding what, of course, the consumer wanted, but more on what could be a dream. And then, that really created history. You can just imagine that in the last seven or eight years, from one mall, if I'm not mistaken, we did many thousands of shopping malls. And I remember the great satisfaction when 100,000 people would visit Crossroads on a single day. And so many people in the beginning would come and tell me that, thank you very much, we had only seen what Singapore was and you've been able to bring us to Singapore in Bombay. Or others felt that we feel as proud now that we have the equivalent of what was the Taj Mahal in Agra, we have something in Bombay. Remember that was a time when there were no other malls. I mean, today it would not be, but and this is not that far, it's only about seven years ago. So dare to dream is my other mantra that I would like to share with you. But if you only dream and don't have a bias for action, then they can not be. And therefore, whatever you can do or dream, you can begin it. And you need boldness because it has genius, power and magic in it. So you need to begin it now. The bias for action, again, a lot of us get work thinking about dreaming and remain in the dreams of worrying about all the issues, why we can't do this. You know, Professor Devda, you spoke about 2000 and Y2K. Let me remind uh, many of you that there were so many people who said that the whole IT uh, story of India will finish after Y2K. Y2K is the only thing that India is good at and the IT story will finish. But actually the rest is history. So if we have action and if we have dreams together, I think we can. We, we, we can succeed. The other thing which I feel a very a favorite quote of mine again is courage. Whatever you do, you need courage. Whatever course you decide upon, 
there is always someone to turn you to your own. To map out a course of action and follow it on an end requires some of the same courage which a, a soldier needs. Peace has its victories, but it takes brave men to win them. We have a business which manufactures uh, bottles, small bottles, for the pharmaceutical industry, and we are the world leaders in that. And about five years ago, we said that the growth in the bottles for the pharmaceutical industry was getting restricted. And therefore, let's look at other bottles. And let's look at, again, smaller bottles are more complex than the larger Coke and beer bottles. So we said the smaller, more complex ones are the bottles that go into perfumes and cosmetics. There were everybody who said that it is not possible for an Indian company to go into the fashion industry of cosmetics and perfumes. If this was exclusively the domain of the French industry. Even the U.S. companies have not succeeded in this. But we said, let's do it. We had some courage. We got determined to do it. Almost like the way that Mr. Kadli and his company did it with uh, the very successful Indica. And went on working on it. And which means that today, we are the largest manufacturers of cosmetic or nail polish bottles in the world and are the most cost-efficient producers of popular bottles in the world. So it is possible to do things if you have the courage and the determination to do so. I believe very strongly that if you have to succeed, and that you need to have integrity. What does integrity mean? It really means a congruence of what is what you think and what you uh, what you do and what you say. Uh, there has to be a congruence between your thought and your speech and your action. Because people are always looking at details. And if people easily find out that what you are saying, is there any truth in it, whether they would believe it. Because in some ways, leadership is always getting people along with you. And if they find that you don't have integrity, let me say that they would not follow you as a leader. I think one needs optimism because there are lots of challenges that will come in, in life. There is lots of areas where you will find that things are not going as what you had dreamt of. But if you don't have in India, I feel an entrepreneur, if you are not optimistic, anywhere in the world, frankly, an entrepreneur needs to be optimistic. If you only look at the downside of things, it, you cannot be successful. You have to look at the positive side. There is always, the sun will always rise the next day. If you remember that, then I think it is very important. Uh, you will be successful. Finally, I think that we need to make a difference in life. You know, we are all privileged here. All of us are more privileged than so many others of our fellow countrymen who have not got everything. I mean, if you see the if people can live on a dollar a day, those lives are different from us. So we are privileged. We need to strive for a higher purpose. We, we need to make a living by what we get. Or we make a living by what we get, and but we make a life by what we give. So again, giving back to society. I mean, I always wonder, in India, that the education that you get is at such a low cost. I mean, uh, Professor Murthy and all, you taught us when it cost us, I think, 500 rupees a year to learn. Now, I know my children have been educated in the U.S. And I know that it cost my, uh, me $60,000 a year to get my daughter educated in the U.S. Six, so, her MBA has cost me, without other expenses, $120,000. And mine cost me 100,000 uh, rupees. And yet, I find that people in the U.S. give much more back to their institutions than what we in India do. So why is it? I mean, everybody who goes out from a management institution, whatever it be, gets salaries in several lakhs. Why can't we give back to society and to what our institutions? My appeal to you is, and I think it will make a difference to each one of us as well. I'm 
last part I am going to do is belief. And I said here, what I want is belief in India. Let's believe in this country of ours. Just to give you some, I know you spoke, uh, Dr. Bedeker, about uh, science and about iron ore in the beginning and alloys. But let's talk about pharmaceuticals. Shushruta was the first plastic surgeon in the world. I mean, there have been complex surgeries which have been uh, explained by him, including plastic surgery, including very complex gynecologic and obstetric procedures have been already mentioned by them. Or let's take a Bhaskaracharya I spoke to you earlier. He calculated the time that the Earth took, many years, many centuries before we knew about it. Algebra, trigonometry, calculus, all came from India. And if you look at GDP, if you look at this chart, and you see on the extreme left, in 180, 33% of the world GDP was that of India. And between India and China, 60% of the GDP was contributed by India and China. This started reducing when, in 1978, we reached probably the lowest when only 3% of the world GDP was contributed by India. It is now inching forward slowly and later on I will show you some statistics which show how it will become significantly higher. So there is some resurgence now. And if you look at the components of GDP, why there is that services now form more than 50% of the GDP, manufacturing 28%, agriculture 21 percent. And if we are saying that our GDP this year is growing at 9 percent, what we find is that it is the services of the manufacturing which is growing high and the agriculture is in the low 2-3 percent growth. So if we, but agriculture still is the predominant employer. So two-thirds of the people are still in agriculture but contributing much lower to the GDP. The hope is that if we can get agriculture to move up as well, which I hope with all these investments taking place in agriculture, the sad part is that for 10 years the production of wheat and rice in this country has remained stagnant. But if we do something to improve upon this, then you will find that it is not very difficult to reach the levels of GDP that we want and the 8 to 10 percent GDP that people are talking. If agriculture, which is really dragging down the GDP growth rate, if something is done, and it seems something is happening, what one with the government spending money and the other with also modern methods being used by industry, I'm hopeful that we will be able to come. And this is what Goldman Sachs says. You may have heard of the famous BRICS report, which talked about the economies of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. This report was released a few years ago. At that time, they said that they expected India's GDP growth rate to be 5.7% per annum till 2020. Now they've revised it recently, about a few months ago, they released a new report, which says that it could be 8%. And if India's GDP growth rate is 8% in 2020, then what they are saying is that India GDP in dollar terms, so on the same basis, not on purchasing power parity, will surprise, will surpass that of the GDP of UK and France by 2015, by Ger Germany in 2020, Japan by 2025, and believe it or not, we will have a bigger economy than that of the US in 2020. So we will be the second largest economy if we do these growth rates. And it's not impossible to do, but this is what the world is telling us. So India... ...for a business where the valuations are much higher than anywhere else in the world. Or if you look at it in terms of the IT companies, SEI, CMM level 5 is the highest level of uh, quality in IT companies and 75% of these companies are from India. 
or I told you about uh, pharmaceuticals, the largest number of US FDA, which is again the highest standards for quality, for compliance, are out of India. And frankly, for many of us who have seen plants across different countries, including in the US and Europe, will find that the plants in India are actually of a higher technology. It's not only in pharmaceuticals, it's in engineering and across the board. The National Highway Project, as you know, this National Highway uh, uh, Authority, the largest single highway project in the world is being implemented, the Golden Quadrant Action, which is likely to be completed in 2007, this end of this year, is the largest single highway project. The NAC and the BSE rank third and fifth in the world by number of trades. We are one of the six nations with that like large capabilities. So there is a lot going for us and we have already done a lot in India. But I still feel there is one last issue that I want to raise <coughs> that we, far, we lag far behind in innovation. Uh, and if I just take one example as patents, just being a surrogate of innovation, then the number of patents which are filed by one company, the IBM in the world, is more than all the patents that are filed in India. So we need to do much more in terms of innovation. Thanks to the socialist economy that we had for so many uh, decades, we were always a nation which copied. We did not create IP. Now is the time for us to create intellectual property. Because only that will give us a sustainable uh, future. And in the words of Dr. Michelle Kerr, we are in India should not stand for imitation and inhibition, but for innovation. We are in industry, we are in every individual should stand for innovation. It is with this as a background that we in our company started a research center in 2004, which is doing basic research for discovering new drugs. I spoke to you about Shushruta earlier. You all have heard about Chara. All these people were the ancient people who discovered medicine and treatments in India. But unfortunately, in the modern world, there has not been a single drug which has been discovered out of India. That is the challenge which we have in front of us. And that's what we are trying to do in our company. And when we inaugurated this research center, we had uh, President uh, Abdul Kalam come and inaugurated, and on that occasion, we had uh, presented a, there was an old song, which was written by, again, Tagore, at the inauguration of Sir Jagdish Chandra Bose, one of India's great scientists. He was inaugurating a research center, and for that, Mr. Uh, Rabindra Tagore wrote a poem. We have reselected that and from Bengali translated it into Hindi and put it into music. So I want you to bear that with me. 1917, De Gaulle wrote a poem for the inauguration of the Bose Research Institute. He wrote the famous song, Matri Mandala Punya Angana, right in the courtyard of the temple of your mother. In the song Matthew Mundir, Tagore speaks of a gathering of the greatest minds in the temple of science, gladdening the heart of the motherland, banishing the darkness of ignorance with the light of knowledge, and working for the perfection of the spirit of man and a universal humanity. To celebrate the inauguration of the new Nicholas Bilamon Research Center, by the Honorable President of India, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, on November 18, 2004, in Mumbai, we present Science Anthem. 